This is a sound check. One, two, three, four. This is a sound check. Sound check. One, two, three, four. Sound check. This is a sound check. One, two, three, four. This is a sound check. Well, good evening. Thank you for joining me uh, tonight again, or uh, whenever you're joining me, uh, for our ongoing Bible study uh, on the book of Revelation. Tonight, uh, we will continue to uh, kind of work our way through deeper as we enter into this just amazing piece of, of scripture, and we're kind of just um, glad to do this again. I'm, I'm really hoping that this is giving you some fresh insight into this book that I know is kind of mysterious. Uh, and, and maybe even uh, a little overwhelming sometimes for people and so it, we tend to ignore it and I think that's unfortunate uh, because it is um, a really important part uh, of the word and uh, can be really valuable uh, especially in difficult kind of times for all of us so uh, here we go into the book of Revelation and again uh, just a reminder of, of these sort of three principles that are that are key uh, to us uh, the tools really to help us uh, get into the text uh, and, and really grab it. Uh, to remember that this is poetry. Uh, it is it's self-aware poetry. It's, it's meant to be a vision. And so it's full of uh, rich symbolism and imagery. Uh, it, and again, it's not prose. It's not meant to be just sort of dry commentary. It's trying to tell us something. Uh, and that really matters a lot. So, um, so we're, we're reading it emotionally. We're not just reading it intellectually. We're reading it emotionally. We want to know how does it feel to hear these words and consider these images and what does that do to us? Because of course that was sort of the whole point. Uh, it was um, meant to help uh, that first century audience be in the right emotional space, in the right heart space. Uh, as they prepared the channel, as they went through the challenges uh, of remaining faithful uh, in that time. Uh, so that's the other thing, of course, the context. Um, this was originally written to be listened to, to be heard by uh, those first century Christians who were very much a minority, who were a cult, uh, who faced terrible persecution on multiple sides. Um, and, and, and the point was to be faithful, to somehow hang in there. Um, and, and to not lose track and sight of, of why they believed what they believed. And then, again, that word apocalypse. Uh, this is a revelation. Uh, there are no secrets here. Uh, there are no hidden messages. It's meant to reveal. It's meant to make something known. And that should always then be the question that we're asking. What is this trying to tell me? What am I supposed to be hearing here? Uh, not what I'm digging for, some secret, but what's obvious? Uh, because the truth is that the message is always kind of right there for us. So tonight, part four, uh, the women, the dragon, and the beast, I'm calling it. This is chapters 12, 13, and 14 uh, in the book of Revelation. And, and uh, again, the previous uh, parts are, are posted on the church website for you to take a look at. If you haven't had a chance to catch up, it's all there for you as well. Um, the essence of this first um, conversation is about good and evil, which in its own way, of course, is the whole point of the book, right? It, it's about good versus evil, uh, and, and, but it's about the triumph over good versus evil. Uh, but it sort of lays it out. It's a, it's a parable. It's a playing out of this. And so it's dramatic uh, and it's powerful, um, but, it, but it talks to us. It, it speaks to us. It, it helps us feel our way through what, what does that conflict feel like? And, and how do I experience it? And, and of course, again, how do I stay faithful as this all sort of swirls around about me? So um, 
good is defined in, in the beginning of chapter 12 in, in this image. Uh, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and she was crying out in birth pangs in the agony of giving birth. And over against that then is this figure of evil, this great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them into the earth. And then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. So there are a couple of things happening here in this text, right? One is is the um, the sort of enormity of these figures, the 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 uh, sort of cosmic nature of these figures. This isn't just about naughty and nice, which is too often what we do with faith. You know, it's about naughty behaviors, these naughty words, these particular. You know, we get that sort of vacation Bible school attitude about the word, and 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 we can't let go of that. Um, th this is about grander cosmic sort of forces at play, good and evil, real things. And that's the other thing, they are personified here in this, in the woman and in the dragon. And yes, I know uh, dragons aren't real, right? It's a fantastic beast. I mean, we want to remember that this is written to an ancient people. And so for some of the hearers, uh, perhaps there was a sense that dragons and sea monsters were real. And of course, there are those figures all throughout the Bible, dragons and sea monsters and all of those kind of things. But even though it's a fantastic figure. It's still meant to be real. It's a personification. So it's not just the idea of evil. It's the actual existence of evil, the embodiment of evil in the world. And so it's, it's meant, obviously, to ask that question, right? Where do I see this reality of evil? In, in what actions, in what persons, in, in what systems in the world uh, are, is this, this hungry dragon um, that that stands in front of this this beautiful right vision of, of life, uh, this mother about to give birth, this this treasure uh, of all that is good and right uh, about existence, and that's the other thing, of course, is that it's good and evil in conflict, right? So it's not just good versus evil, but it, it's the it's the 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 interaction between the two, the the dramatic battle between the two, and and that's sort of a constant meme in the uh, book of Revelation, a constant uh, theme in that book, um, that, that um, you know, where the two clash, right? Because, of course, the point of the book is to see good overcoming evil. So the conflict is a necessity so that we can see the triumph of the good eventually. So so here is this dragon. He's, he's before this woman who is about to give birth. And, and, and of course, his, his intent is to do that most evil thing, right? To rob her of her child, to rob the world of its future, to rob the world of its hope. And that, that's really what evil is. Evil is this force that threatens um, any good thing that might sort of come about. And, and so then it says she gives birth to this son, this male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was snatched away and taken to God and to his throne, and the woman fled in the wilderness. It's pretty obvious, right, that the male child being referred to here is, the, is Jesus, right, the birth of Jesus. Now, sometimes we talk about the literature, especially in the New Testament, in groups uh, based on um, communities that have certain founding traditions. So there's the, the Pauline communities, those, those communities that Paul started. And then there's uh, the Peter community. So you get the Gospel of Mark and the letters to Peter. And then there's the Johannine community. So you get the Gospel of John, the letters, the epistles to John, and the book of Revelation, which tend to kind of get grouped together, and they tend to be very similar. Right, so so here is this notion of 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 the Christ figure of of, uh, of the child who's born and, and is immediately takes this heavenly place that it belongs to, right? Which is a very sort of John theme, and and then the woman, of course, then flees, and I, I think that probably the best metaphor to think about the woman is to think of her as the church, right? The church now that lives in the wilderness that that is on the run because it's being chased 
by the figures of evil. A, a great description of what the church is, and, and especially a challenge for us when we think of the church in this very institutional sense. The church is in charge of the world. Uh, in, in the days of the book of Revelation, the church is just the opposite. The church is constantly under threat. And, and it is that threat that gives the church life. And that, that's sort of the, 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 the part that we miss. And maybe in many ways what has been the worst thing for the church. You know, so once the church is sort of brought into the world and, and becomes an institution of the world, it, its primary job seems to be to save itself. But, but the early church, the church that lived under persecution, lived at the mercy and the benevolence of God and depended on God's grace and God's protection. And in that way, that church was much more faithful uh, than our church can hope to be. So you get this notion of this woman who, who flees into the wilderness, into that desperate place, and that is where she has a place prepared by God so that she can be nourished for this length of time, 1,260 days. There's one of those numbers that's a common experience uh, in the book of Revelation, and it's just a number, right? It, it's a number that means a long, long period of time. But the thing about those numbers, especially when they are descriptions of time, is that they're always finite. Now, while it doesn't necessarily give us a specific understanding of what that length of time is, it reminds us that, that whatever it is that we are going through, wherever it is that we are, this is just this time. This is just for now. Because, of course, the book points to a new ending, a new day. And, and so whatever this is, and however hard and bad this is, this is only for a while. This difficult time is not forever. It's not endless. It has an ending set. And that's maybe some of the best news that the book of Revelation has to offer for that community as it suffers uh, in persecution. That, that it's only for now. It's only for a while. Um, there's a different time coming and we're going to get you there. So then we get to probably the really climactic part of the book of Revelation. And even though we're only in the 13th chapter, this really is the beginning of the end in its own way. Because now comes the great war in heaven. A war fought between Michael and the angels and the great dragon, the great monster. If, as you read through, especially chapter 13, do not miss out on this important part. The angels fight the battle. The people do not. The book of Revelation is never, 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 I want to say that one more time, never a call to arms. The people, the faithful, the community are never called to take up arms and join in the battle. The battle is fought for them and they are the witnesses, the martyrs to, to God and God's angels winning, fighting these beasts, throwing down these beasts for them. So Michael and the angels fight the battle and then of course immediately in the midst of the battle there's a hymn of praise as I've said many times before. Um, worship is such a significant part of the book of Revelation. Uh, it, it is, again, where much of the language of our classic liturgy comes from, from the book of Revelation, because that's what the people do. The people watch God fight against evil, fight against these terrible forces, watch God overcome these forces, and, and, and their role is to sing the praises of the God who fights on their behalf and always wins. What's particularly beautiful, and this is actually a pretty common theme in the language, a common thing in the language of the book of Revelation, but really clear, this, the, this amazing phrasing, now have come, this is what the people sing as Michael, as Michael and the angels defeat the dragon, now have come the salvation. So while on one hand the book of Revelation uh, is leading us to some great final outcome, that final outcome is already a done deal. There's this, this uh, what we call eschatological understanding that undergirds this story. Whatever is going to happen is pretty much already happened. God has already determined what the future of all things will be. And all we're seeing in the book of Revelation is that being played out. 
we're just watching it happen. We already know how it's going to end. It's like any good adventure movie. We know in the end the hero will triumph. And while we might get caught up in the drama, I mean, we hopefully will get caught up in the drama as the, as the movie, as the story plays out, we already know where we're going. That's what makes it possible for us to get through the movie and to get to the end of the thing, right? I mean, it would be hardly worth watching if um, if the outcome were unsure. It'd be it'd be silly. It'd be ridiculous. Um, that's not the case here in Revelation. We know how the story ends. The people are being reminded that they know how the story ends. That's what will enable them to get through whatever lies in the meantime. Which is also kind of clear here in the 13th chapter. So the dragon is defeated, but he's thrown back down to earth, right? And, and, and for a time, the dragon is going to roam free, and the woman, or the church, as, as we're thinking about this metaphor, is going to have to remain in the wilderness. It, it is really the great unanswered question of this vision. Why does there have to be a meantime? Why does there have to be a time when when evil forces roam around? We're going to come back to this in just a little bit, and then we'll get to the beast next. A question that remains unanswered. But this is what we can say for sure. It's true. I mean, it, part of the point of the book of Revelation is to describe reality as it's actually happening. Again, too often we look at this book and we're looking for predictions of what's yet to come. And we miss out entirely on the point. This is a very accurate description of what already is. That's what makes the book prophetic. That's what makes all the prophetic books prophetic in the Bible. Because they are completely true and honest about the way things are. And when we take an honest accounting of the world as it is, of ourselves as we are, of our lives as we live them, then it's obvious what's going to happen next. We don't have to be told. We don't have to have a prediction. We can see the outcome when we are clear about the path that we are on. So the point of Revelation is to say to the community of the faithful, if you are enduring, then here you know what the outcome will be. God will bring you to this new kingdom. God will deliver salvation to you. It's been done. God has conquered. That was the whole point of the cross. That was the entire uh, purpose of the resurrection. God is more powerful than any of the forces of this world. Even the tomb could not contain him. And as you believe that, then all you're doing is watching that unfold in the reality as we're kind of living it. So we get with, done with the dragon and then we get the beast, right? I mean, there is this sort of, uh, of repetition that, that happens in the book of Revelation. And I mentioned it last week because we went from the seven scrolls to the um, uh, seven um, um, trumpets. And, and next week we're going to talk about the seven plagues. Right? It, it just kind of goes on and on and on. And again, I think that that's part of the power of this vision is that the welcome to life. Right? It goes on and on and on, and it never seems to get any better. And, and there's that reality, again, to this writing, as it just describes life as it is. It's hard, and, and there always seems to be another monster around the corner. We get rid of the dragon, and we throw it into the pit, and then here rises this beast. Again, this mythical creature, this amazing fantasy kind of creature that is as terrible as it can possibly be and does as much damage as it can possibly do. It says it opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God. And this is, by the way, the first time that God now becomes directly under attack uh, by these forces of evil. It utters blasphemy against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. It was given authority over every tribe and people and language and nation. So a, a couple of things that, that we want to hear here. One is this whole idea of blasphemy against God. Right? How do we identify evil in the world? Well, one of the ways that we identify it is, is blasphemy against God. Not swear words, right? But... but the, here's a great, I think, definition of what blasphemy really is. Mistaking God's true nature or violating or doubting 
God's power. So I hear two things. One is mistaking God's true nature, that is denying that God is a God of grace and love. When there's a lot of that kind of blasphemy that happens in the world, when we describe God as a God of wrath and judgment, that's a blasphemy against God because that is not God's nature. That is not who God is. And the entire purpose of the cross, as I have said many times in many Bible studies, is it is a demonstration of the extent to which God will go through to prove his love for his people. How far will God go? He will go all the way. He will go to the very end. He will go to death itself. And so to speak any other description of God is to blaspheme, right? Or to violate or doubt God's power, right? The power of God to save, the power of God to fulfill his promise. So important to that community, again, as it faces persecution, as it's being challenged to be strong and steadfast in its faith, to doubt God's steadfast faithfulness is death, right? That's, that's an apostasy. That's a blasphemy. And, and John's vision is to encourage the people to not doubt that God will come through um, because that's what the beast does. That's what the enemies do. And, and then again, here's this other thing. And, and again, this is that same conversation. Why is the beast allowed? to exercise authority. Why is the beast given authority? First of all, notice that the beast has no authority of its own. Whatever power evil has, God gave it that power. Maybe to serve some ultimate purpose of God's. Um, it may be that, that, that it's, it's essential for God to show to his people his capacity to defeat every false god. Um, having watched the people create false gods, God's going to show them what a false god is really like so that they'll know what it means to be faithful. Maybe, maybe that's the challenge for us. And Luther said, and, and I think rightly so, God does not allow trials to come upon us. God doesn't cause these difficulties in our life. But to remember that God can be present in them that they are not stronger than he is or more powerful and and to not give up and, and and suddenly worship them and i think that sometimes when we become so afraid of the things of this world that we allow that fear to dictate who we are and what we do we have allowed those things to become our god when when we know when we know, when it has been shown to us, that only God is our God. And, and whatever terrible things happen are not bigger than what God is. And God will ultimately triumph over them. And that's really the point of the book of Revelation, is, is to remind the people not to cave in to their fear of this world and start worshiping the powers of this world as if they were somehow ultimately the authority in determining how life came out. That's not how we can be. We can't survive that kind of faith. We've got to do better. So after the beast, there comes a second beast. Oh yes, a second beast. I mean, not enough to have one beast. So we get a dragon, we get the beast, we get a second beast. But what's significant about this second beast is that he marks his followers. This, of course, is that famous 666 passage, right? That's where that number comes from, that horribly unlucky number. No, there's something terrible about it. Um, that if you do numerology, if you believe in numerology, if, if, if we understand that correctly and you know we're trying to look back through two millennia now of history, um, that mark uh, somehow brings us to the name of the Emperor Nero, uh, who was one of the great persecutors uh, of the Christian community. That could very well might be what it means. Uh, one of the other things I read that I thought was rather interesting is that the biblical number seven uh, is one of those perfect numbers. You know, seven days in the week, the seventh day being the Sabbath day, and we see so much of that through, especially the Hebrew Bible. 666 is not quite seven. So the followers of the beast are marked as being less than perfect. Right? If Sabbath uh, it is one of those things that marks us as faithful followers of God, then, then, that, then that sort of distinguishes us from the followers uh, of the beast. Now, m maybe that's too much to make from it. What's, point, what's clear, I think, that the, the clear point that the book wants to make is that um, 
the faithful are identifiable and so are those who are not faithful. One of the clear themes uh, of of the Pentateuch, one of the clear themes uh, of the, you know, the, the those post-Exodus years is is that the followers of God, that God's people, his chosen people, are, are identifiable um, in, in obvious ways, like circumcision, and in less obvious ways, like the rites and rituals and dietary practices and, and so much of the detail uh, of the Torah. And, and the point is not to get so confused up in the detail as to miss the point, that somehow faith does set us apart from the rest of the world. And, and that's what we're looking for. Right, is, is how do we live out a faith that shows that we're different? Jesus' comment to his disciples at the Last Supper, right? By, their, by your love for one another, that's how the world will know that you're my followers. So it's, it's not, just something sim not just something superficial, like a tattoo on a forehead. It's something deep and profound that marks us as followers of Jesus. And that's, that's what we're sort of looking for. So after all of the beasts, now the lamb... Right, the 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 worthy one comes uh, to mark his chosen, and he gathers together those his chosen followers. And, and again, here's another one of those numbers. Right, we get 144,000 specific number of the chosen. Right, it's the 12 tribes. It's 12,000 each in the 12 tribes. So again, it's it's a number that's meant to represent an entirety and all. Um, so it's. So it's not that specific number. And yes, there have been those interpreters of the Bible that have said, well, only 144,000 are going to get saved. And, and it makes me kind of question, you know, is that 144,000 in first century terms? You know, when there weren't maybe a couple of million people in the world? And is that a different number now that there are 7 billion people on the planet? It, again, here's where we can get stuck down in the weeds and miss the point. The point is, is that there are the chosen ones. Right? The point is that God chooses his followers. And, and, and so we have been elected. We have been chosen. Not because of the things that we do. It's not our choice. We belong to a God who chooses us. Who laid his grace upon us at our baptism and called us by name and marked us with the cross. And said, you are mine. And that's the heart and soul of our faith. And it's not that we are chosen and some are not. It's just that we are chosen. And what does it mean for us to live out that choice? What does it mean for us to try to, to, to live out the truth of that choice every day in all the things that we do? Well, the answer, in, and it's right there in the book of Revelation, is, is right there in, verse, in chapter 13. Here is a call for the endurance and the faith of the saints. Wait a minute. What does it mean to endure? If we accept the grace of God as this given gift, right, this chose choice of God to, to pick us out of all of the world, to, to pick us to be his, then, then our only response can be to endure. In the trials and tribulations of the world and of this life, to just hang in there. That's what it means to live in grace, to not give up. Right, to, to hold on to our faith and not let go, no matter what. And no matter all the temptation, no matter all the tribulation, to try to be faithful in all the things that we say and do. It's not a call to perfection. It's a call, we are called by a God who understands that we are broken creatures, that we have this capacity to cause harm to ourselves and to one another, but still to keep on trying to be as faithful as we can, to do the best we can as much as we can. That's really what the book of Revelation is about. That's the highest calling, to simply endure and be faithful in the face of difficulties and persecution, to not be led astray by the powers of this world that has a very, very different agenda than God does, to believe more in the kingdom of God than we do in the kingdom of this world. That's not a little thing. That's an enormous thing. That to follow the ways of the kingdom of God uh, is tremendous. And it is very much counter to the ways of this world. But again, this world persecutes us. This world punishes God's followers who try to be faithful. 
that's why we have this amazing vision uh, of a God who in the midst of that conflict where where good means always staying true to God and evil means constantly being under attack in the midst of that to, to stand firm and to not let go of the promise that God will triumph in the end and in God's triumph we will find life. Thank you for joining me tonight. Next week we will uh, go to part five and the seven plagues and then the horror of Babylon. Uh, a great phrase um, uh, that Luther uses in his description uh, of the church of his day um, and in a pretty challenging image. Uh, one of the things um, that, that we uh, don't want to miss in the book of Revelation is that it is also a story about justice and it describes the evils of this world. It's not uh, just simply ethereal. Uh, it's very real uh, and, and the images uh, of Babylon are, are far too true uh, to how the world is today uh, and I think they will be challenging to us. Uh, as always, as you have comments and questions, you can leave them here on the Facebook page or check in uh, with me and I'd be glad to talk with you too. Uh, God bless and have a good night and we'll look to see you next week.